Hey everybody, um, I bought a new mic, so I just need a thumbs up from my producer, Tandy. Can everybody hear me? Great, okay. Look, I'm gonna be very quick because we have a dope guest on, activist, artist, um, Kendrick Sampson. And honestly, I haven't seen any body in his generation of that stature, and I mean stature, right? Like um, insecure. I watched Vampire Diaries, so I was like, oh, wow, you know, this brother's dope in so many ways. And I've gotten to know him and he's really done a incredible amount of work. And I think um, right now, like artists really have to choose what side they're on, right? So I just wanna just drop a couple of things because as we say, everything is like breaking news all the time. Um, but right now it is Texas, Florida and South Carolina that are seeing huge, huge, increases. Um, today, those three states reported their most deaths um, during the whole coronavirus today. Um, uh, counties are ordering refrigerated trucks. And as someone who saw that in New Orleans and then Puerto Rico post New Orleans, Katrina post Hurricane Maria, it's very real. Um, and you know when bodies are getting put in there, but they're ordering extra ones. Hospital in Miami, Dade, a couple of them have officially no ICU beds. We're at three and a half million people just in the United States. Um, yesterday, you know, the megalomaniac and his cronies are now going to send the coronavirus virus data to him before it goes to the CDC. So we know what that means. And um, counties are also renting out hotels so that they could take people in who are not in critical condition. And I think it's important that we remember that people get sick of other things. So there's cancer patients. What if you get in an accident? You know, um, unfortunately, what about if you're someone who's been domestically abused or a, a woman who's gonna have a heart attack or anybody, like all of that stuff was already there, right? And now this huge strain. And one thing I think I've been mindful of is when you intubate somebody, most likely they're never coming off that ventilator. But there's also a certain medicine that has to be administered um, as they're getting intubated. So I think these are a lot of things we are not aware of and that we have to keep in mind. And, you know, it's where we're at. And we don't have too many choices. Um, I think right now we have to mentally begin to prepare that we're going to be in this for a long, long time. I know colleges are starting. I want my daughter to be able to go back to, quote, high school, that experience. Yo, I'm in New York, and we're a safe state, and we got an outbreak right now. So, and then you have people in Utah who are coming in to a city council meeting without masks. Today, some guy put out a Walmart, uh, he pulled out a gun at Walmart because somebody asked him to wear a mask. This is where we're at. So you have to mentally prepare yourself. Physically, try to get out there and walk. But mentally, people are gonna really have to start grappling with that, especially those of us who have mental health issues. You know, so um, let's bring Kendrick on and we will also send mass shout outs and happy birthday to Asada Shakur. One of my favorite quotes from her is, people get used to anything. The less you think about your oppression, the more your tolerance for it grows. After a while, people just think oppression is a normal state of things. But to become free, you have to be acutely aware of being a slave. And then Ida B. Wells Barnett, um, who as a self I, I told myself to be, a, no, I didn't teach myself to be a journalist. I didn't go to school for this. Um, she said a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home and it should be used for that protection, which the law refuses to get. So happy birthday, Ida B. Wells Barnett. Thank you what, for what you did by documenting lynchings and raising a family and also raising hell within the, the women's suffrage movement where they at one point said, before black people get their vote, we as white women need to get it first. And there's a PBS two part documentary. And it's the first one I've seen that really includes not only her voice, but what she did at one of the large marches. So try to watch that. And it's Asada, mad people appropriating her, mad people are saying her chant, 
you know, and don't organize, you know? And I think, um, well, first we're lucky that she's free and safe by the sacrifice of so many others that are still in prison here in the United States. But, um, you know, read Asada's biography. If you're chanting her, you need to read her biography. And I wonder what her message would be to us right now if we could see her. So um, let's bring Kendrick on and we'll, we'll, we'll do the Cuomo videos, the 30 second clips, some in the middle. Hey. Hey. How are you? Tired. <laughs> oh, okay. Tired. First, I was going to say, I totally right in, went right into it, but everybody, if you don't know, this is Disrupted Chaos, and I'm Rosa Clemente. Um, I saw you yesterday. Was that yesterday in front of Jackie Lacey? Every Wednesday, every single Wednesday, we uh, co-organize um, uh, and amplify the work that Black Lives Matter Los Angeles has been doing for so long. Yeah, I mean, um, the chants were all new, and I love them, every single one. Um, so I was in, you know, being having been part of BLM LA, uh, today's five years ago that we left LA to come back here, um, but I desperately miss Melina and the family because that's who brought me out there, that's who sheltered us and all of that. But um, I love this picture of you and Melina. I wish to have brought, well, it's on the flyer. You're you're like out there doing your thing on the stage and she's just looking at you. And I know how much she has been an influence to you in this work, you know? Um, and everybody who kind of caught comes across Melina is like, do you ever sleep? And the answer is she sometimes does not. <laughs> yeah. But Kendrick, you were born in Houston, so you probably have family and friends there. Um, you've been an actor for a while and um, you have bold leadership. So those are the things I, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about. But first and foremost, how are you and how is your family if you have family all over the country? But specifically because you were born in Houston, have you heard from family there about what's happening? I have. I have a lot of family there, so I haven't heard from everybody. But um, uh, everybody is different, you know, like... Um, most of them are okay and uh, relatively healthy. Um, my dad has a lot of underlying conditions, so he's been by, you know, kind of by himself. Um, uh, he wasn't doing too well, but it wasn't because of COVID. Um, and was having some problems with the VA because, you know, veterans ain't taken care of, especially yeah. black and brown, right? Um, and then, um, I, I do have a cousin, uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly, like second, whatever, uh, but one of my cousins is is uh, in pretty bad shape because of COVID and might not make it through because he had some underlying conditions, was like very much like, you know, social distancing and, and then made um, one bad move and they, they're pretty sure that that's what what happened actually him and his wife uh caught it uh but she's she didn't have underlying conditions so she's gonna be okay um everybody else my nephew is actually a, a little his his is more mental you know the quarantine he has not been dealing with that very well yeah. um but everybody else i have a lot of nephews nieces brothers sisters um everybody else seems to be all right yeah, I have um, a huge family. Uh, my mom, my abuela, my mom's mom has 16 babies, <laughs> all in, uh, yeah, like 16, all came out, all were with us until last year when we lost one of my uncles due to other issues. You mm -hmm. know, so like 121st cousins. Half of them are not my friends or fam, they're like my blood, but they don't like my politics. So that's been, so I got, but I got like 10 that I contact and a lot of them are in Las Vegas. And I had to call my brother and be like, dude, put on a mask. Like yeah. what is happening? You know, and this was before we've been here. So I I'm glad though, that you also brought up the mental health issue as well, because you've talked about it. I've been honest about mine. Um, and I think that it is important that we see young children might not be able to express themselves fully, but 
we're starting to see regression in some kids. I kind of see it in some people in my family, but um, because you've been honest with your issues around mental health, I mean, was it something that you you've known for a long time, like something not right? I'm I, I'm not feeling like good, not sure, or was it something that you were able to pinpoint and then be able also to be like, okay, let me figure this out and like take care of myself mentally as well. I was always open to it and I was always super interested in, in, um, in, um, psychology. Um, because my brother had severe mental health issues and I watched him navigate that and watched my mom navigate that, which was, you know, hard and, you know, misdiagnoses and all that, um, that come with the struggle for, you know, uh, improving your mental health and and um, and then and I always had problems and uh, but I, I had a very bad experience with the therapist early on that you know divulged information that I said in the meeting to my mom and it was very oh, obvious. Yeah. yeah and I was just like was like I, I don't want to do that but I did um, I just didn't trust it right um, because they have an obligation to tell your parents things or whatever back then. So I didn't trust it. So, um, but I used to watch, you know, one of the whitest shows, uh, uh, Frasier. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna be a therapist. I used to think anything that I saw that I was like, oh, that's, I like this character. I'm gonna be a lawyer. Um, uh, thank God, thank everybody that I became an actor because, um, and I knew this truck, this uh, damn, uh garbage truck was gonna come right when we start it's uh, okay i mean we got helicopters in albany everything yeah 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 you know but um but yeah so so i did uh i did i i was always interested in it and i and and you know i studied i went into psychology class and in, in high school and um uh, my mom wanted to actually be a counselor uh she was either gonna be like a musician, um, cause she plays piano, she's a pianist or, or a counselor until she found the world of sales and realized that that pays a lot more and did something miserable for 40 years of her life instead of what she was really passionate about, which yeah. inspired me to follow my passion. Um, it's going to pull up right in front of <laughs> Anyway, uh, it's all good. So, it's fine, baby. It's all good. <laughs> so, um, you know, I uh, I've always had a, a, a passion for it, and to find alternatives, right? Because I saw what the effect of different medicines, and I'm not opposed to uh, West, completely opposed to Western medicine, but as a first, um, as a f like first uh, resort, I think is is problematic when there's so many alternatives. I found out what art therapy is uh, when I was like 18. I met a black art therapist, which was insane. And at the time she was saying she's the, she was the only one. Um, and then there's like somatic experiencing and um, acupuncture and so many different um, alternative forms of therapy. Uh, and, and then talk therapy is incredible. And, and I go once a week, but uh, I think when I've, really started noticing the or understanding my anxiety. I've always had pretty high anxiety, um, but the effects on the physical effects of how it was really affecting my 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 physical health uh, was in my early adulthood when I moved to L.A. and things got so intense because I was living on my own. I ended up in the hospital and um, and, and they were um, they were like, so you're young. And you shouldn't be having these problems. So uh, I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that this is anxiety and it's not a guess. You need to get help. So I started started getting help. Yeah, um, that's interesting. You talked about your experience when you were younger and not trusting the therapist because I had a similar experience. Um, and where I was living at that time is a very white suburban neighborhood or black people that are very rich. You know, as I tell people, it's a little town called Elmsford, New York, 20 miles from the Bronx where I grew up. 
And I'm always like every weekend I would be in the Bronx with like my fan fam, right? Like they're in the hood. They're like hip is hip hop is going like all this. And then five days a week, I'd be in this like utopic little town where you never saw police and everybody knew your name and crazy stuff. Um, and even with that, I had dealt with some childhood trauma in, in not the best of ways where, you know, but I was open to it. And my mom, give I'm giving her credit, took me somewhere. And I was, the first two sessions were amazing. And then unfortunately my pops was like, yeah, I'm not coming back. And then I was like, well, I'm not going back. And you know, I'm 15. And it really took a friend of mine to be like, yo, you have mad anxiety. And I'm like, no, I don't. They're like, you just told somebody off. Like, that's not what happens in a meeting. Like you have mad anxiety. And luckily I listened to that person, but it's been up and down because I think there's years where you might take medicines, then you plateau. And then you're like, I don't have anxiety. Everybody else is crazy. Or you find some way to get addicted to something. Um, and in our communities until very recently, it was like, you didn't talk about this especially people viewed you quote as successful college. I got a job, all of this kind of stuff. And it said that um, we have an article from the Washington post that says depression and anxiety spike among black Americans after George Floyd's death. So this COVID experience and you also being an activist organizer, how is your anxiety now? Or you're able to more be like, okay, I'm managing it. I might not be able to meet y'all tonight from, you know, my mental awareness, awareness and wellness. I mean, shit, I ain't need nobody tonight, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, to a rally because y'all stay out. I'm like, I'm loving LA. I'm missing it right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I, uh, so, I mean, it's, I'm sure that, Black anxiety, you know, black depression and anxiety and mental health issues were exacerbated by George Floyd. But, you know, it was it was exacerbated before that by Ahmaud Arbery and by all the videos of police brutality in New York and um, Chicago and L.A. Uh, because of COVID. Once we were finally let out of quarantine and they started criminalizing our trauma, they started, you know, saying that we were. Um, just the news that we were disproportionately affected by COVID is is traumatizing, and the experience that people our people are dying um, uh, at an unre alarming rate, and people that we know are getting sick and and being fearful, and then and then being criminalized for not wearing masks and being criminalized for wearing masks. As soon as I heard rumors, I was actually in New Jersey when I heard rumors that they were going to start quarantining people, like mass quarantines. I was like, oh shit. And we, I called Build Powerful, you know, our team and was like, we got to start getting um, as many resources together for mental health as possible. Um, and, and started uh, organizing around a mental health campaign called Liberate Mental Health. And from the ideology that we can't really truly liberate mental health unless we really take on a framework of abolition and reparations um, and, and abolish all these systems that are targeting and, and forcing trauma on our community. So, so we gathered those resources and released them and, and are working on some uh, mental health uh, liberation um, uh, campaigns and stuff that we will be releasing. But, um, you know, it, 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 for me, I, I, you know, I've been it's been a struggle throughout COVID because it's a different lifestyle. We don't know it's unpredictable. We don't have the, the word, the, the uh, work, we don't have the um, proper infrastructure in our neighborhoods. I have uh, my own therapist that I see uh, once a week. I should be seeing twice a week. Um, but uh, you know, yeah, we put out this, um, this open letter uh, on America's mental health crisis uh, uh, and launched our Liberate Mental Health campaign through that article um, where we talked about some of the statistics and causes and um, generational trauma and the fact that our largest mental health care provider or institutions are jails and prisons. 55% uh, of men, 
73% of women in state uh, prisons and jails have mental health issues. Uh, we haven't ever had significant or adequate uh, investment in mental health um, care in this in, in our country. And we still prioritize profit over people in our health care system. Right. So, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do in that area. And personally, uh, I have a lot of work to do. I haven't I haven't stopped working on, you know, as soon as this crisis started, as you know, we all start, went into crisis mode and started trying to liberate folks from, you know, the from rent uh, and and the health care, poor health care and um, disproportionate effects and and police brutality and stuff. So there hasn't really been like Melina Abdullah. We end up texting and calling. Actually, when we did our first when we organized the first protest, uh, a public protest anyway, outside of. Um, they had they were doing virtual. Um, I was like, we got to get outside. We got to get we got to do make this public. And she was like, hell, yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, I ain't call nobody else that would talk me out of it. Uh, I know she knew she was going to be down and um, and she was going to be awake. And so at like four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, we jumped on the phone. Um, and that is. Uh, you know, we were just kind of fed up and, and they were already organizing around the black L.A. demands of what our our community needs uh, and 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 refuting the two hundred million dollars that Eric Garcetti was trying to raise the police budget by and then went into, you know, the defund the police movement anyway. So it's been nonstop. nonstop. Um, so yeah. I've been and doing my best to get a little sun to properly nourish and, yeah. and and all that. But, you know, you can only do so much when we're in crisis mode. I know. I mean, I mean, first and foremost, folks like me and you have health care. But at one time, your health care lapsed through the union and you had to do what's that? No. Right. Like one time your health care had lapsed. Say that one time. Oh, I, yeah. 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 And you have posted about, you know, just like a technical error and all of that. And I think all of us who have had insurance have dealt with that in a second. Like, no, I sent you the premium or it's my human resources office that was late. But we both have health care and so many people don't, you know, but there are a lot of good resources folks out there. Like I'm um, go to Bold Power and also um, Ultraviolet and their specific websites specific to Latina women, because Latina women are the highest de demographic of those who um, attempt suicide, and then African-American younger men. So, um, and there's a lot of black and brown therapists that are out there offering their services. And I think at least my experience with a therapist was over 30 years ago. There were, I'm sure there were black therapists, but who would know like in Westchester County that there was someone that looked like me. Now I'm very, adamant like no i need a black woman i need a puerto rican woman because there's also cultural issues but i mean you talk <clears throat> about the influence melina has had but obviously black lives matter and recently you wrote this um open letter where 300 of your fellow peers has signed have signed on i mean you're in hollywood it is an interesting uh place you often are like in this weird bubble and then begin to realize like, oh, these folks are human too, you know? And um, we're not all perfect in what we say or what we did. And what I have found interesting this week is reading a lot of Viola Davis, where she's like, I should have never done the help. You know, I'm coming to terms with that. When you wrote um, this open letter, how was the response from like elders in Hollywood and like a lot of the younger folks coming up? Was everybody like, yeah, we're down with this and thank you for spirit and that. I mean, Hollywood has like, you know, a history of anti-blackness and 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 at its foundation. And so it operates as Me Too movement and uh the Me Too movement and um uh Time's Up exposed and Oscar So White and and Black Lives Matter, frankly, uh uh has exposed um that, you know anti-blackness is at the center in and and so or as a is a central or foundational part of how hollywood has been built as well as anti-indigeneity uh you know uh very um 
misogynistic and sexist and transphobic stories are and narratives that are told and um and and it the environment is corporate and capitalistic right um and so we have to dismantle those practices and systems in within Hollywood uh, in order to truly liberate folks. And we have such a pervasive and uh, strong influence over culture and politics. Um, and we have a responsibility to change that uh, culture from oppressive to 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 um, liberatory, to a culture that is uh, centered in liberation. Right. Um, and so we're trying to push that. We had a really great response to the letter. We got over 300 uh, black folks, um, uh, prominent, you know, like Queen Latifah and Viola Davis uh, and Tessa Thompson was help, helped with organizing. So did Color of Change and uh, Patrice Colors and Melina Abdullah were part of it. And um, we were honoring the movement for black lives and Black Lives Matter and the People's Budget LA and continuing that vein and, and saying, this is what Hollywood needs to do to stand with the movement, divest from police and and uh, divest from anti-racist content, I mean, divest from rant racist content um, and invest in anti-racist content and invest in our careers and our communities. Um, and, and that is, and we have our list of demands on the Build Power website and, um, and and we got a, a really incredible response now at the same time everybody wasn't in agreement right there was a lot of input to it uh you know we don't all have to agree but we all agreed on liberation and uh we ran into some obstacles and some folks that weren't uh so but that they, they were very much in the in the uh minority i hate that word but yeah uh, no, numbers wise but numbers wise they were in the minority mm -hmm. of the people that were were um that were opposed to, but um, Viola Davis was actually the first person to sign, and um, and she's dope, and she's actually I'm glad she said it publicly. Um, I, I don't I haven't ever wanted to uh, say it, but she she has said that privately many times uh, about you know the help and and um, that narrative and and many other things that she's she's one thing that I, I find that so fascinating uh, about her that I learn a lot from her uh, is she is very vulnerable and um, uh, critical of even her own actions, right? And, and, and she shows how you can grow no matter where you are in your career, she's got, she has no reason to necessarily question her choices, right? Um, or, or uh, be critical of herself. She has awards on awards on awards. She's, you know, doing, she's an icon, you know, as Vanity Fair has uh, finally, you know, she has, has recognized publicly, but we know, you know, she's an icon. Um, and and uh, I've learned a lot from her, even with my time on how to get away with murder, most of our conversations on set were about black folks, about what we can do to advance and, and um and you know i love her her quote and video that i posted two years ago uh it's making its its way around again not anything because of me but because she's incredible um a, po a video of her uh interview where she's like you know i have a, a career comparable you know or a path comparable to meryl streep and all these folks and she's like but I'm not valued in the same way. Like pay me, if you really value me, if you say I'm the black Meryl Streep or whatever you want to call me, then, you know, pay me what I'm worth um, and treat me like, like, I, like I'm worth. She does not have the same opportunities and such. So um, yeah, I, I admire her a lot. Yeah, you know, um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you a couple questions about that. First, um, I think Viola Davis um, is different in this sense. Like she grew up, um, people don't know, in Providence, Rhode Island, which people just assume like New England. So the Albany, Vermont, Adirondacks, like all the beauty and you're like, is some of the most racist 
you know, what Malcolm talked about, there's no racism all the way down. But the Northeast and Western Massachusetts are extra special kind of racisms. So every time I see her in an interview, I'm like, okay. And then she she didn't get in the game late. She got her first parts late. And then she was very clear, like, they ain't paying me the same money they're paying Meryl Streep. Um, with that said, I, I do think that still you brought all this group of people together, what would it look like for folks to kind of institution build literally? Like maybe not brick and mortar at this moment, but I always wonder, and especially after being able to attend the Golden Glows and being in this crazy world for 48 hours, which I actually had a lot of fun. People critiqued me, I don't really care. I was with dope women of color that have been doing shit together for 150 years. Oh shit, that's my Instagram. This is what happens when you're live. But um, mm -hmm. I talked to her that night and she knew all of us. And she was like, oh, you're on Puerto Rico, Toronto Bark, obviously all of that. But there is something to be said about the capitalistic system. Like how much change can happen in a world that is not only capitalistic, but also, um, at least for the, until COVID, has been creating so many of the narratives. Like, what have you found when you try to, or when you're in a room and you're like, I ain't trying to explain this to y'all no more. Like, not just the folks that signed on your peers, but the, the executives and agents and publicists that up until now have run Hollywood, you know, like, what does that look like when you're in a room and you're like, dude, do I have to talk about racism again? Like, do I have to show you the video of me being hit with rubber bullets? Like, do you find that daunting in a point where you're like, let me do my craft, but also, you know. I mean, it's just what we got to do. You know, right. it's like, you know, yeah, it's literally in every, every, in every uh, industry, um, we just, you know, we have to t put on multiple hats. And and that's one thing that we're working on with Build Power is like organizing. Our, our main goal is to organize liberation culture, um, to make it cultural in Hollywood, uh, to counter the oppressive uh, legacy of, of Hollywood. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's getting people to identify like what we've been talking about. I mean, the, the conversations have been draining, but also exciting because people are now willing to talk about like, you do realize this is this is just another version of capitalism. You know, you do realize that this is not this not, does not equate safety. You do realize that this is also discrimination and that people are like, yeah, you're right. You're right. How do we change that? you know, um, as opposed to maybe two months ago, you know, <laughs> it would have been like, I mean, but you still get folks, you still get folks from within the community and outside uh, um, that are not completely on board, have different ideals. Um, that's just the diversity of, of us and, and, and white supremacy at play. Uh, and so, you know, uh, it, it's going to be a frustrating process. Um, I, like I said, it's it's tiring, but it's also exciting because the conversations feel different, look different, sound different. I just want to make sure that we are being vigilant in solidifying this change, uh, this shift, so that this is the baseline and that we don't regress and then have to have these conversations again. I want, you know, the, the conversations need to be at a, at a new level. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think now that what when people are in this space, right? Like no matter what, nothing will be the same again. I don't know what that will look like. It just won't be the same. And, um, you know, I, I have to say, I, I, I didn't think there would be anybody that would make the Fred Hampton um, story, but, and I can, I can publicly speak about it. Now I know I told you in a, uh, a while ago when I saw you in the fall in New York that um, for the last two years, I have been working with um, Ryan Coogler, uh, Charles King from Macro and uh, Shaka King who wrote the, the, with his partner wrote the, 
the, the script and it luckily it was filmed and filming ended at the end of October. And um, it was supposed to come out this August, literally for Black August. And now it's been pushed back because uh, the executives think that it will really be huge if we could get back in theaters. And let me tell everybody, like, let me be 100% clear. Fred Hampton was involved from the beginning. His mother and him gave um, approval right before filming. And also we are working and continue to work hard to, to solidify the Fred Hampton house in Chicago. But post my experience is what I realized, especially talking to a lot of um, younger folks and sisters in, in Hollywood was, it's not the fear of money, it's almost the fear of being labeled a troublemaker. And um, I think that has changed right now because I think right now, younger folks, no matter whether it's you or cats in the street, people working three, well, maybe working one job now, that they're, um, there's almost this like lifting of like fears over, like that shit is off. We might make some mistakes, but that's not gonna be one of them. Um, I think that's what I've seen, you know, um, in especially a younger generation, but you also have bold leadership and you started that a while ago and folks go to my website, rosaclemente.net and you can see a video um, that um, was produced last year in San Diego with some partners and Kendrick's in it. And uh, um, I sent my video uh, court videographer there. I actually got sick and couldn't go. So I was so angry. I wasn't there with you all, but it's there. And I feel like you've always been right on the issues, which then allows you to be in these spaces like, okay, black people, undocumented people. We have to see what's going on on the border. When you were in San Diego last year, is that like the first time? Well, I have to say you're from Houston, Texas. So you've known this immigration debate, but um, when you were there and you like children are in cages, is that what literally made you be like, yo, I'm out, I'm going wherever I need to be. And also um, grow bold leadership. And I know you have to go soon, so I got you. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, I, was that last year? I was like, man, I thought it was 2018. Um, I could be wrong, you know, I but don't I don't remember. I'm like, everything is just a blur. No. Well, because time doesn't make sense anymore. It doesn't, and That's it's crazy. Right. Um, it might have been two years ago, <laughs> but it's on the website. So far. I don't know. I love. I mean, that was that was one time. I mean, we've been to San Diego. I also don't like. I remember the march. We've been to San Diego probably six times. A couple times went across the border. Um, I also went to Tapachula down uh, at the bottom of Mexico with uh, Black Alliance for Just Immigration and Bill- Shout out Nana, shout out Nana. Don't shout out Nana, yeah. Nana is for family. incredible. Um, and um, to, to look at the, you know, the black immigrants being, you know, facing harsher treatment uh, from Haiti and um, in different countries in Africa. Um, and then, you know, in Texas as well, into the border there. And the first, actually the first time I did like an action for specifically for immigration was 2016. Um, uh, during the Obama administration at the border that was the, uh, I think it was the uh, Pueblo Sin Fronteras, like the same like caravan coming up. Um, in 2016 to the San Diego border. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I knew about the issue. I wasn't well versed in it until probably 16, 17, um, when I started getting, in 2015, I started, you know, being more comfortable and, and uh, educated on, um, radical politics and and open to the idea of like what are borders and you know <laughs> like uh and, and and like xenophobia and harsh treatment and people in cages and what that means and um and really want to connect when i so you know 
I don't know how many trash cans there are. But no, that's the recycling now. Before I mean, we could call it, it's not for you recycling. Jesus Christ. That's <laughs> what it is. Lord, how many? How many? <laughs> um, so, we can hear you. <laughs> um, but I, I really wanted to make a, a clear connection that that is state violence um, and that, is con that it is connected. So I was involved with Black Lives Matter movement, but I went to Standing Rock to represent Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. to show that that police brutality that they're experiencing to protect corporations because of capitalism, right, um, is no different than what's happening in our streets, right? Just because it's happened on the reser reservation doesn't mean that it's any different and it's not different from the oppression of America and it's not different from what's happening at the border, that this is all state violence, state sanctioned violence, violence and um, and it's all connected. All our liberation is linked together, you know, and and uh, that in Black Lives Matter Los Angeles uh, at that same March, I believe uh, that you're talking about the, the march right in San Diego. Yeah. Um, yeah. They pulled up a bus load deep, you know, and and uh, and I think that that is it's really important to to have that um, to show that and 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 it's no different you know to make it even broader that it's no different than the violence of you know our elected officials choosing to invest in our oppression over our liberation um, and the care that we need in our communities mental health care infrastructure schools after school programs um, and and all of that uh, it's it's no less violent than that. Uh, either, but um, but I have a, a direct focus on state sanctioned violence, and and I think that that is all part of the same fight. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm glad you spoke with that because I think Black Alliance for Just Immigration. What has always happened is that particularly African immigrants have always been erased from the story. Um, you know, a lot of stuff with Haiti and the Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and this idea that. Um, you know, all, especially on the West Coast, that African American and particularly Mexicans or Central Americans don't get along. And I think um, when people see us out there and we, we make content, like we have a long history working together. And at the end, this split benefits white supremacy. We need to talk about that. So before I let you go, what would you want specifically like younger folks to know? You're now in that time period where you're like, you're not an elder yet. You still get like three years to be a youth. In my book, 35. <laughs> anything at least in the 90s we're always like you're youth to your 35 um but also you're in la and it's like i would let tom dway abdullah and all of melina and my child lead us into freedom forever but what do you want younger folks to know especially those that are artists and artists meaning actors um you know poets and all of that what would you want them to know about this time and what they should be doing um, you know, uh, we look at like the main of artists like Marsha P. Johnson and uh, Paul Robeson and um, Harry Belafonte, even, you know, allies that actually were accomplices, right? Like Jane Fonda, um, Susan Saran and those folks that have been doing doing good work. Um, you know, they they put their careers on the line, um, and uh, in direct alignment with the liberation movement. And um, we have a duty to do that. You know, as you said, it's uh, Asada's birthday today, so it is our duty to fight for our freedom. And it's our duty to use whatever privilege we have, whatever platform we have, whatever tools we have um, in that liberation movement. Our purpose is not our career. Our purpose is not our passion, right? What we're passionate about. Passion can go many different ways, but, you know, when we call our passion, it's our passion is a tool for liberation. Our purpose is liberation. Our purpose on this earth is to seek out the most vulnerable and use whatever privilege or tool you have um, at your disposal to liberate them. And when I'm talking about the most vulnerable, I'm talking about the intersectionally oppressed, the most intersectionally oppressed, right? As the Kambahee River Collective taught us. So 
you know, with our art, with our, there is one of my favorite sayings is, uh, 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 sin arte no hay revolución. You know, there is without art, there is no revolution. Um, you know, there we have to u- utilize our art. Um, it is the most effective form of communication. It is metaphysical, so it gets down to the core of who we are. It is it pierces with truth um, and can do things that just words and rhetoric cannot. Um, and and statistics and legislation absolutely cannot. Um, and yeah. so we have to, we have a duty to utilize the gift that has been given to us um, to connect to people through art uh, in order to push the revolution forward um, and honor the work of our ancestors. Yeah, well, Kendrick, I really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. And, um, you know, I thank you for rocking with us tonight. Everybody check out Also, what he's doing is institution building. And at the end, at least all my elders have always said, you have to build an institution. If it doesn't exist, build it and then be in solidarity or at least be in unity with the idea of what you said. We're in unity for freedom. Let's, if you don't take away what I, how I want to get there, I'll discuss how you want to get there. So thank you for your time. And I really appreciate it. I can't wait to be um, back in the streets with all of you, but you know, um, your Instagram live yesterday, I was like, these might be the best chance of the year. So, (laughs) and um, you know, obviously uh, for your family, like all of us, we wish them mad um, health and love and safety right now. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll talk to you. Peace. Absolutely. Peace. So, yeah, um, you can check out uh, what um, Kendrick is is doing with bold leadership and all of that. And, um, you know, I, I always I'm at the point now where I'm like, you know, almost whatever anybody's doing for 15 or 40, I'm going to rock with. I'm going to support, you know, Look, we all got to fight together at this point. Like this system is really showing so many of its flaws, but also is showing like how we can be more in solidarity and unity with each other around politics, not necessary personalities. So um, we're going to end tonight with our political prisoner, freedom fighter. And as I said before, um, today is happy born day to Asada Shakur, who's still with us in you know, and safe and Ida B. Wells Barnett, who's just an incredible, incredible person. If you don't know who she is, please just Google her right now and uh, read the red record where she um, documented lynchings. Um, Dr. Barbara Ransby from Chicago wrote, I, I guess it would be called the most definitive biography on Ida B. Wells Barnett, it's incredible. And there's a couple of documentaries out there. Um, so today, before we leave, uh, Romaine Chip Fitzgerald, a former member of the Black Panther Party, has served 50 years, 55 zero. And I'm wrong. Barbara Ransby, Dr. Ransbury wrote on Ella Baker. Yeah. Paula Giddings, Dr. Paula Giddings, who I'm not sure she retired from Smith in Western Massachusetts, but she wrote the definitive biography on Ida B. Wells Barnett. I knew something wasn't right there. Um, He is the longest incarcerated Black Panther in United States history. He entered the state prison as a young man when he was in his teens. He is now 70 years old and a great grandfather. He suffered a stroke, is in ill health, and gets around with the use of a cane and a wheelchair in prison, in prison. This is crazy. On a hot summer night in 1969, three young Black Panther members were driving down the streets of central LA. A bright red light shined in the rear view of the car. The car was pulled over. A tense situation began to unfold. A California Highway Patrol officer walked up to the car. Men inside complied with all the police demands. Shooting began. Something went wrong. Within a few minutes, a struggle took over the streets. No one really knows what happened that night. There was, of course, the Highway Patrol version and the Black Panther version. But whatever happened, the situation turned violence. Within a very short time, Chip was wounded, as was the officer in a brief shootout. He escaped a weeks later, um, and the other two were captured. Upon his arrest, 
Chips Chip pleaded not guilty to the charge of attempted murder of a CHP officer during the days before he was arrested. He was accused of being involved in the death of a security guard. Although the evidence against him was weak, Chip denied any involvement. Um, I didn't get my second page, y'all. And that was my fault. So um, Chip has not given up on his principles and struggles and due process. So you cannot um, check out and support and write Write the PPs and POWs. I mean, POWs, the thing about people incarcerated at this point is that a lot of visits have been suspended. So I just need people to imagine what it would be like to be behind these walls and for many years at least have someone come visit you and now no one can come. So um, letter writing could be a good way. I mean, maybe that's what we should go back to, but please um, go and support the movement to free Chip Fitzgerald and also go to jerichomovement.com.org. I always forget, sorry. But Jericho Movement around freeing our political prisoners and every PP and prisoner of war also has their own support committee. So check them all out. Yeah, Obama was definitely, oh, I have a couple more minutes. Um, Obama definitely wasn't trying to give clemency, which he did to Oscar Lopez Rivera, he should have done that to all the political prisoners, all of them, including Leonard Peltier, the American Indian movement, you know. Um, so right now, I think you have to realize that a lot of these people that are incarcerated for their political actions are clear why they're there and um, have created some type of life behind the walls while still being active outside of them virtually and all of that. And this is a really good time to get to know who our PPs and prisoners of war are, you know? Um, yeah, so look, I just got this book because I want to really encourage everybody. Um, she was on CNN maybe a couple months ago, definitely on Democracy Now! a couple of times. And please check out I Mix What I Like with Dr. Jared Ball and also um, Renegade Pop cast with um, Kamal Franklin and Kalanji Changa, who are uh, brothers down in Atlanta doing a lot of work. We have to support real independent black and brown media. There is no reason why there's not more of us there with all this content being created. It's still through like this white lens and white gaze. But when I saw her um, speak on CNN and I saw her on Democracy Now, I told myself, I got to get this book. And it's been out it's been out of stock for months and I finally got it and I'm going to read it this weekend and talk about it more next week when we'll be back Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And it's called The Coming Plague, Newly Emerging Diseases in a World Out of Balance. It came right like 10 minutes before I started the show. So check it out. You know, I would just encourage everyone at this time and I'm going to see it as much as possible. Whether you believe in conspiracies or not, whether you think this virus was created in a lab, which most likely it was, you know, people are dying and a lot of intergenerational families because we live with different people, generations, a lot of young people thought they were invincible. And for any young person, you think you're invincible. <laughs> I thought I was, you know. It, it's just what it is, you know, and especially people under 25 who think they're invincible and then missing their lives and all of this. But if a mask keeps you safe, it keeps people around you safe. And there's so many of us that I am not going to go see anybody in my world until I'm tested. And I can't even get tested in New York because I don't have the symptoms, you know, but I feel very safe you know, and I just would never want to be the person that causes someone else's death because that's what not wearing a mask means. OK, so I know it's hard and no, none of us have been through this. The only person that's been through this is someone who would be 104 years old that could they were one years old when the Spanish flu happened in 1918 that killed 50 million people. They kept telling us this was going to be over in the summer. We don't know that now. What happens on the West Coast is different. We get winter here and by October 1st, it's gonna be cold in the Northeast. The virus thrives on that. The West Coast, they don't get 
those temperatures right now. We or climate change has changed everything. Don't be that person. Like I hate seeing people I care about and comrades out without their masks. You know, I'm not this is not a, actually this is not a political argument for me. It's a scientific argument. It's science. One in 100 of us have it. There are super spreaders in our community. There are children being born into this world. There are people who are vulnerable. I just ask people to really think about like, what does it mean for you to put a mask on and why won't you? And I'm not talking about people down South or what people think are Trump voters, okay? I could walk anywhere in New York City right now or in Albany and now see more and more people without masks. So honestly, I don't go out. I don't like it. It suffocates me. I go out once a week to go food shopping. I do not go out. So I don't care what that means for other people. I know that part of it is I would feel awful if I had it and passed it on. You know, that would be me. Um, my, our Tandy, our producer says, they think we're sheeply living in fear and slaves to media hype. Which yes, that that could be true too. You know, I'm not even discounting that. I know I have an underlying health condition. My daughter has one. I know my mom had to get tested and she got her test back and it's all good. And I know some people in my family that might have it. So, you know, I think until we know and, and really have epidemiologists be like part of the front lines of the voices on this, um, yeah, and I know it's it's still an individual choice for sure, but I wear my mask, so yeah. Here's mine, another one. This is how I'm supporting small black businesses now. I'm wearing masks, but you also have to be able, make sure you get the N95 filter because they don't work if you don't have the filter, which a lot of people don't know. So thank you for rocking with us tonight. Um, thank you for joining us. We will be back on Tuesday where my guest is going to be Leah Peniman, one of the founders of Soul Fire Farm, which we are so, oh yes, yeah. Oh yeah, wait, let me wait. We just got to show, look, I have this love-hate relationship with Chris Cuomo. I'm not even going to lie. If I had to pick a white boy, he might be the one. I probably shouldn't be saying that. Well, Brad Pitt and a couple, George Clooney, yes. Um, but I, I watch his show and I'm most of the time like, it. I don't like what you're saying. And then sometimes he just says what we all want to say. And yes, he is the brother of Andrew Cuomo, who is the governor. Um, there's a lot of complicated <laughs> things that I feel about Chris Cuomo in terms of journalism. And like, dude, you're still like one of those white boys that like you're privileged and you'll listen to black and brown people. But do you really understand? I just want to show this because this was the best thing I heard that kept me going last night. When I was like, this is insane. We have a president with Goya. <laughs> you tell me how a president in the middle of a pandemic has got time for this bullshit. Yeah, basically. You, hawking products and Goya, I don't care who it is. Resolute desk. This is what he's resolute about. Pandemic priorities. It's crazy. Daughter Ivanka, top White House advisor. Are you kidding me? Marketing for a brand following calls for boycotts after Goya's CEO heaped praise on Trump last week. On your dime in the middle of a pandemic, they're selling beans. Are you are you kidding me? Seriously, seriously. This is not left and right. This is reasonable, my brothers and sisters. The guy's sitting on the Resolute desk with a bunch of Goya products. Oh, my God. You tell me how a president in the middle of a pandemic has got time for this bullshit. Are you kidding me? We Hawking wanted to play. Goya. I don't care who it is. <laughs> so, yeah. Resolute desk. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, we're all calling bullshit. And... On behalf of all Puerto Ricans, we apologize for the Goya family who was not born in Spain, no matter what they want to tell you. <laughs> so part of me is like, don't tell anybody they're from Puerto Rico. 
but then like they ain't from Spain. So we have to like, and I appreciate the boycott. Their stock has dropped. Everybody that I know that's Boricua has been doing this stuff on like, we got to make our own seasonings and all that. But exactly, you were sitting as the quote president with Goyer products. And your daughter looks like she should be Serena from The Handmaid's Tale. If anybody watches Handmaid's Tale, she literally is Serena, just in white instead of blue. This shit is crazy, y'all. You know, it's crazy. So sometimes you just got to be like, I call bullshit and I'm going to sleep and I'll get up tomorrow and just work and do the work that I got to do. So we appreciate you rocking with us. Um, you know, shout out to our producer, Tandi. Shout out to everybody who is watching and sharing it. Um, make sure you take time for yourself. If you need a day by yourself, Netflix, all of that, it's all good. Like we're going to be in this for a long time and we're just going to have to figure out as we always do and adapt, especially as black and brown foes, like what does this look like while we're in it? What does it look like when we're out of it? And what are the things we're not going to accept when we basically rebuild a new way of being? Like this is probably mother nature and all our ancestors being like, all that's happening must stop. And you as human beings have to figure out a way to live in cooperation and not war and death, you know, um, and take the time to read and just chill. It's okay. I think we always want to be productive. That's what capitalism does. It makes you feel bad for relaxing and breathing and saying, I'm just going to chill today, you know? Um, so with all that say, we thank you. We're back on Tuesday where I said we're going to be with Leah Penniman, who is co-founder of SoFire Farm right here in upstate Troy, New York. Um, we've been rocking with them since we came up here. So grateful at this time what SoFire Farm is doing. We're also going to have Loida Limbal, who uh, just directed this incredible film about um, um Oh, shoot. about oh, domestic workers or care workers. Um, you know, it's been getting great reviews. It was supposed to premiere outside after Sundance, but all of this happened. The documentary is called Through the Night. And then on Thursday, we're going to have this brother, Jay Jordan, on, who is the husband of Carmen Perez, formerly incarcerated, who is doing incredible work with formerly incarcerated people. And I'm um, Kat Brooks, an incredible organizer out from Oakland. Um, and we're going to have just a lot of dope people. And hopefully, Tamika Mallory, um, no matter what, like folks are holding it down for Breonna Taylor and Louisville, Kentucky. And the fact that many of them have just been charged with felonies for what was a, quote, peaceful protest. They were sitting on the grass. They were sitting on the grass in front of the attorney general's office. I mean, house on the grass. Um, and now they a lot of them are charged with felonies. Um, so she has a has hectic schedule, but we hope we have her on next week too. So until I, we see you next week, you know, everybody just take care of yourself, take care of each other, stay safe, stay healthy, stay up. We'll see you in the whirlwind and share out the video of our interviews and all of them that we've done. Everything's on YouTube under my channel, Rosa Clemente. Thanks everybody. See you next week.